This is my previous AM4 platform PC, and this is my brand new AM5 platform PC. And today I wanna talk about the difference between these two platforms. And if you stick with me throughout the course of this entire video, I promise you, if you're even remotely considering upgrading to AM5, switching to AM5, I will save you a ton of time, money, and a whole lot of headache. And if you're already on the AM5 platform, then hopefully some of these tips will also help you to make your life just a little bit easier. I was able to help some of my Discord members with their boot times and even clock speeds on their CPU. So stay tuned for all of that. But first and foremost, let's talk about why I switched over to AM5 to begin with. Now, to be completely honest, the AM4 platform for me personally was rock solid. I had the Asus ROG Strix X570e gaming motherboard. I had 32 gigabytes of DDR4 Corsair Dominator Platinum RAM running at 3600 megahertz. And as for the CPU, I started off with the AMD Ryzen 3800X. I eventually upgraded to the AMD Ryzen 5800X. And finally, I landed on the AMD Ryzen 5800X 3D. And in all honesty, I could still be using this today with zero problems. It's a great platform. It's rock solid. I know your mileage may vary. We all have our histories with different pieces of hardware. And maybe in the past, Ryzen wasn't good for you. But for me and my family and my friends, everybody I know personally that has ever used a Ryzen chip, we have nothing but good things to say. And honestly, I love this platform, rock solid. I definitely recommend the AM4 platform. If I'm being completely honest, I was this close to going with the Intel platform and getting the 13700K. That chip is absolutely awesome. And I think it is still one of the best all around CPUs on the market currently. But ultimately, I went with AM5 simply because I already had people within my community switching to AM5 and they were starting to ask questions and I couldn't answer those questions without hands-on experience. Additionally, the 7800X 3D came out around the same time. It was performing incredibly well in the benchmark tests and I already had a 5800X 3D, so it kind of made sense to just go ahead and upgrade to the next X3D chip, if you will. Plus, I also like the idea that AMD seems to support their platforms a little bit longer. So hopefully, if everything works out the same way it did with AM4. Eventually AM5 will be very stable and very mature and ultimately you can get multiple CPU cycles out of it. Now obviously I can't guarantee that's going to happen but ideally I'm hoping that is what will happen considering how that's exactly what happened with AM4. Now with all that being said there are performance benefits to be had in gaming even above 1080p when you switch to the AM5 platform and get a 7800X 3D and I'm going to show you some of those gaming performance benefits towards the end of the video. But first, we really need to hammer home all the problems you're gonna encounter. Now, you may already be familiar with Gamers Nexus new video about the 7800X 3D exploding and all of that stuff. I already had this video planned well before any of that became an issue. The problem is I had so many problems with the stability and reliability of my AM5 platform, I could not get this video made. I had to halt production, return components, buy new components, and keep debugging and troubleshooting before I could finally get my system stable enough to actually film this video. Here's what I can confirm. My 7800X 3D has not blown up, it hasn't sparked or smoked or done anything like that. It's running and performing totally fine. However, the problems I have had are basically this. I went to Micro Center and I picked up an Asus ROG Strix B650E gaming motherboard. It was the all white edition and I got a really good deal on it. And then I coupled that with some white RAM, DDR5 RAM from Team Group running at 6,000 megahertz. And then of course I picked up the 7800X 3D. I brought all of that home, set it up, installed it and no post could not get it to post. All I kept getting was that terrible, annoying orange DRAM light that I cannot stand with a burning passion. Now, I knew AM5 would have slow boot times and long memory timing configurations and all that stuff, but I did not know I would go through everything that I went through. So both six of RAM were installed, could not get it to post. So then I started searching online. I saw a subreddit with the exact same issue on another Asus motherboard. And it turns out that even though the manual tells you specifically to install one stick of RAM, if you only have one stick of RAM into the A2 slot, the solution actually came down to clearing the CMOS and then only installing one stick of RAM into the B2 slot and then booting. And sure enough, it worked perfectly fine on the first try 
and then I was back into Windows. Then you can shut down your PC, install the second stick of RAM into the A2 slot, reboot the PC, and now everything's working totally fine. So okay, we're totally good. There, there was a little bit of an issue there, but nothing that Reddit couldn't help me fix, so we got all past that. Okay, good. But now I was in the BIOS, and I noticed something incredibly weird. AM5 is supposed to use Expo profiles, but there was no Expo profile available. There was only a DOCP profile, and I thought to myself, you know, that's a little bit weird because Expo is the new standard, not DOCP. But then I got to thinking, well, you know, I didn't buy an X670 motherboard. I bought a B650 and maybe that has something to do with it. So anyway, I enable DOCP. I boot into Windows. The task manager reports the correct speed. From there, I proceeded to meet my friends online. We played Call of Duty all night on a Saturday night. Two days later on a Monday morning, the system would no longer post. I even went back and tried the trick again where I cleared the CMOS, installed one stick of RAM into the B2 slot, nothing. I could not get the system to post at all. I kept getting that dreaded DRAM light again and again and again. So I took the RAM back to Micro Center, switched it out. In the process of doing that, I noticed a very important piece of information that I did not notice the first time, nor did the Micro Center employee notice it whenever he sold me the RAM. And that is the fact that in the bottom left-hand corner of that package, it clearly said Intel optimized. Back in the past with DDR4, there were some RAM kits that clearly said AMD optimized, Intel optimized, but ideally there were no severe compatibility issues whenever you would try to mix and match the RAM optimization with the CPU. To the best of my knowledge, if I'm wrong, let me know in the comment section below, but I'm not aware of it. However, I can confirm with the AM5 platform, it is so sensitive and so finicky when it says Intel Optimize, it means Intel Optimize. So please make sure if you're switching to the AM5 platform, when you purchase your RAM, make sure it says AMD Expo on the package. Make sure you are not buying Intel Optimize RAM. Personal experience, I'm telling you right now, make sure you pay attention to the package and what it says and if it says Intel or AMD Optimize. It does matter. Now, we're back at Micro Center. We switch out the RAM. Again, I go with Team Group, but unfortunately, the only thing they had for AMD was slightly lower speeds at 5600, but you know what? Okay, that's fine. It's still way faster than DDR4. Let's take it home. So we're back home. Two more sticks, DDR5, 32 gigabytes of Team Group RAM running at 5600 megahertz, and I pop both sticks in. I don't have to do the clear CMOS. I don't have have to do the B2 trick or anything like that, pop both sticks in, hit power, boom. We're right back in the windows. Everything's running totally fine, zero issues. Now I start the game, I start to edit some YouTube videos and everything's fine for a couple of days. Then Asus released a brand new BIOS update and it said, make sure you're using this if you have a 7800X3D. Now keep in mind the BIOS I was on was already 7800X3D compatible. This new BIOS description, really made it seem like, hey, if you're on the 7800X3D, you really need this BIOS. So I said, okay, and I installed the new BIOS. Right after that, I could not post anymore. Turns out one stick of RAM completely stopped working after that BIOS update. Now, on one hand, I was thinking, you know, well, it, it's possible that one stick of RAM just so happened to die at that exact moment. How likely is that? Probably very unlikely, but it could have happened, right? Then on the other hand, I'm thinking, well, maybe the BIOS update somehow killed that stick of RAM or simply refuses to read that stick of RAM. I wasn't really sure, but all I knew for sure was I could only get one stick of RAM to actually work with the system and post. And at this point, I'm thinking, you know what? I'll just go back to Micro Center again. I'll return the RAM again. I'll get a brand new stick of RAM and, and we'll be fine. And then I got to thinking about it. I said, you know, I don't want to be in a position where I can't comfortably update my BIOS without having to worry about something breaking. And on top of that, I've had nothing but issues with this motherboard and RAM combination ever since I bought it and brought it home. Let me just return both the RAM and the motherboard and go with something completely different. And so that's what I did. And so I ended up with the MSI B650 Edge Wi-Fi motherboard. And now my RAM is DDR5, 32 gigabytes, Corsair Dominator Platinum running at 6,000 megahertz. And yes, it is AMD optimized. And of course I bring that home, I set it up, I boot the PC and boom, it worked perfectly fine. And I'm happy to report that for the most part, I've had a fully functional and stable system ever since I switched out the motherboard and the RAM. Now, with all of that being said, there is one little exception. 
every now and again, not all the time, but every now and again, whenever I shut down my PC, the next time I turn on my PC, it will not post. It gets caught up in that boot cycle with the memory configuration and it will not get out of it. However, I found out the solution is very simple. All I have to do is kill the power to the PC by flipping the switch on my power supply in the back of the PC, wait about two or three seconds, turn it back on, boot up the PC, and boom, everything is totally good again, and we're right back in the windows with zero problems. Now, I have no idea why this keeps happening. All I know is that it is an intermittent issue. There's no consistency to it at all whatsoever, and I'm chalking it up to just an AM5 bug, if you will. It's just one of those little quirky bugs that need to be ironed out. And I'm hoping that in time, it will be ironed out with future BIOS updates and AMD chipset updates potentially. So we'll have to wait and see how that works. But right now, my system is probably about 90% stable and reliable. I'm also happy to report that I was able to update the BIOS successfully on my MSI board and I've had zero issues. I don't know, maybe I just had a bad ASUS board because it was an open box board. But what I can confirm is that there is something with that combination that does not work. The Asus B650 e gaming motherboard and the Team Group DDR5 RAM do not mix well together. And I'm reporting that based on my experience as well as another member in my community. He bought the exact same motherboard, he bought the exact same kit of RAM, and he had the exact same problem. One of his sticks completely stopped reading, stopped working, and I was able to help him boot back into Windows in private DMs in our Discord chat, but that was only with one stick of RAM. And so ultimately he did have to go out and buy a brand new kit altogether for his RAM. And I think there's just something going on with that combination for whatever reason. It could be an ASUS problem. It could be a team group problem. I don't know. All I do know is that I now have two fully documented cases where that combination of the RAM and motherboard do not mix well at all. And so if you are going AM5, do not go with that combination. Okay, so two more issues. The first issue is the fact that yes, AM5 does have long boot times out of the box. And that really comes down to just memory training. And I'm gonna teach you how to get past that here in a minute. And then in addition to that, your Ryzen CPU will likely not boost to its maximum clock speed out of the box. You will need to change some of the settings within the BIOS in order to get that to happen. And so I'll happily go over that with you right now. So first of all, let's go ahead and tackle boot times. So first and foremost, your motherboard manufacturer may offer a fast boot option or they may not offer a fast boot option. If they do offer it, make sure fast boot is enabled. Secondly, your motherboard manufacturer may have something called a post code delay. And basically that is exactly what it sounds like. It is a delay on your post. It delays you from posting for however much time is listed there. So on my Asus motherboard, that was three seconds. My MSI motherboard does not have a postcode delay, so I didn't have to change it. If you have a motherboard that does have a postcode delay, I would recommend changing that to zero seconds so that you can boot faster. And lastly, the most important setting to change is called memory context restore, and you wanna make sure that is set to enabled. And basically what this does is ensure that once your memory is configured the first time, you don't have to go back through memory training every single time you boot up your PC. This will radically improve your boot times. The only word of caution I would say regarding that setting is that if for whatever reason you change anything at all in your BIOS, particularly with the memory itself, maybe you were dialing in the timing some more, whatever it is, make sure you put that setting back to auto so that next time on the boot, if it needs to go back through memory training, it will do it successfully and you won't get caught up in some endless posts where you can never get outside of DRAM basically. And then you have to go back to you know, BIOS flashback and go through all that stuff. So, so just keep that in mind, okay? But with all that being said, let's talk about your clock speed. The 7800X3D is rated to boost up to five gigahertz out of the box. Mine did not, and my Discord member who also has a 7800X3D, his did not either. But it's okay, I figured out what you need to do, and this will apply to all the other CPUs on the AM5 platform. Number one, enable Expo. If you want AMD to boost the way it's supposed to boost, it needs Expo. So make sure you enable that. AMD is expecting you to use 
Expo in order to take advantage of the CPU and to make sure it can hit the rated boost speeds out of the box. Number two, enable PBO or precision boost overdrive. AMD is fully expecting you to take advantage of this technology as this technology has been coupled with the Ryzen platform for the last couple of years. So make sure this is set to enabled so that you can also take advantage of Curve Optimizer. Curve Optimizer is a feature that allows you to basically undervolt your CPU, improving the temperatures, but not losing any of the performance. And so my personal settings are PBO is set to enabled. I set my curve optimizer to all core, not per core, but all core. And then I set the curve optimizer sign to negative. And then I set the all core curve optimizer magnitude to 30. Some people do 35. You can tinker with that, see what works better for you and your system, but I use 30. Using these settings, I went from boosting only up to 4,800 megahertz out of the box to boosting up to just a little bit over five gigahertz. It is not locked, but most of the time I'm right there around five gigahertz. So it's definitely extra performance. These settings most certainly do work. Okay, now let's go ahead and address the 7800X3D blowing up, the Expo settings, the voltage, and the Gamers Nexus video. Some people's 7800X3Ds have blown up on them. And the root cause is basically something to do with the voltage, more or less. They're still investigating, but that's what all the preliminary results are pointing to. And so now AMD is working with board partners to issue emergency BIOS updates as fast as possible to limit the SOC voltage on the motherboard. And Steve in the Gamers Nexus video even confirmed himself that Expo is not the root cause. Expo is not guilty. And so for all of you out there who are scared to turn on Expo because you're worried about blowing up your chip or your motherboard or anything like that, I understand your concern, and if you're truly concerned, then if you're not on AM5, don't go to AM5. If you are on AM5, then simply don't enable Expo. As for me, I am running Expo currently, and I've had zero issues so far. The most important thing here is to make sure that you're checking for the latest BIOS updates from your motherboard manufacturer, and be sure to get those installed as soon as possible. And now let's compare gaming performance between the AM4 platform and the AM5 platform. Okay, please don't mind the stuttery footage. That is not the platform that is my recording software messing up but right here we have call of duty modern warfare 2 running at native 4k on the balance preset and as you can see at native 4k there is a performance uplift here. The 1% lows are higher, the average FPS is higher, the active FPS is higher, and the average FPS is 138 versus 124 on AM4. And so while it's not necessarily a massive performance difference, there is a performance difference even at 4K when you're not completely CPU bound. And now we're at native 1440p on the balance preset. And as you can see, again, AM5 is pulling ahead of AM4. Our 1% lows is probably where you're gonna notice the biggest performance difference here. You're talking almost a 40 frame performance difference here. That is quite substantial. And our average FPS is 223 versus 209 on average. And so at the end of the day, that is quite a substantial performance benefit just by switching platforms overall. And again, this is at 1440p, not 1080. Hogwarts Legacy native 4K on the high preset. You can see our performance difference here is basically non-existent. Both AM4 and AM5 are in the 60s. Our 1% lows are in the 30s. That's nothing to get excited about. That's nothing to write home about. And as stated in other videos, this can come down to Hogwarts Legacy simply having performance optimization issues. Basically, if you're playing something like Hogwarts Legacy on a regular basis, AM5 is not worth the upgrade. And for whatever reason, my footage got completely corrupted, but here is a screenshot of Hogwarts Legacy at native 1440p on the high preset and as you can see there is a little bit more of a performance benefit here at 1440p you're talking an average frame rate of 109 fps versus an average frame rate of 86 fps and the one percent lows are about 11 frames apart there is more of a benefit there for am5 but still i don't know if that's actually worth the overall cost of am5 next up is spider-man remastered at native 4k running on the high preset and as you can see here our performance difference is noticeable 
but not substantially large. Our 1% lows are definitely a nice increase because we're in the 70s, but our average FPS here is about 19 frames apart. And overall, again, not something that's radically different, but there is a nice performance uplift here in Spider-Man Remastered. And now looking at native 1440p on the high preset, there is a substantial performance benefit here. You're talking an average frame rate of 197 FPS. Our 1% lows are 100 FPS, give or take, versus is 56 FPS and the active frame rate is hitting over 200 FPS at times. That is insane. And so for Spider-Man Remastered at 1440p, there is definitely a nice performance uplift here. Next up is The Last of Us at native 4K on the high preset. Just like Hogwarts Legacy, nothing really to talk about here. Performance is basically the same. Once again, my footage got corrupted, but here is The Last of Us native 1440p on the high preset. And similar to Spider-Man Remastered at 14 1440p, we do see more of a performance benefit here. You're talking an average frame rate of 132 FPS versus 110 FPS. So that's a difference of 22 frames and your 1% lows are about 18 frames apart. That is something that is noticeable in a game like The Last of Us. Next up, we have Halo Infinite native 4K on the Ultra preset. And there is basically nothing to write home about. The performance is basically identical. And now looking at Halo Infinite at native 1440p on the Ultra preset, we now have something a little bit more substantial. The 1% lows are definitely higher on the AM5 platform. The average frame rate is also higher and the active frame rate is higher. I mean, just across the board, the AM5 platform is faster at 1440p when it comes to Halo Infinite, but at 4K, not so much. So definitely be mindful of that. If you made it this far in the video, wow, thank you. That is totally awesome. I hope you found value here. And I was excited to upgrade to the AM5 platform, but unfortunately it is plagued with a bunch of issues. And as I stated before, wait. Yes, as you saw in gaming, there are performance benefits in some cases, even at 4K, but in more cases at 1440p. And that's awesome. But at the same time, when you factor in the cost of the platform upgrade and you factor in the headache of all the things I just listed in the video, I don't really think it's worth it. And so right now I would say, wait, just like I said before, wait. But hey, look, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Are you using AM5? What has your experience been like? Are you avoiding AM5 now? Are you waiting? I'm very curious to know. If you found value in this video, I'm gonna ask for something I never ask for. Share it with a friend, share it with someone so that they don't walk into the pitfall of the AM5 issues right now. I don't want people walking in blindly because they didn't know something would happen, right? And so I hope you found value here. And if you did, please share the video. Also like it, subscribe, do all the things because I worked very hard on this video. I put a lot of time and effort into it. And so thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you down in the comment section below. And until next time, E-Rock out.